Sleeping Beauty Once upon a time, there lived a king and a queen who had no children. They were so sorry about having no children that I cannot tell you how sorry they were. At last, however, after many years, the queen had a daughter. There was a very fine christening for the baby princess. The king and queen looked throughout the kingdom for fairies to be her godmothers and they found seven fairies. Each fairy godmother was to give the princess a gift, as was the custom of fairies in those days. In this way, the princess had all the perfections imaginable. After the christening ceremony was over, the whole party returned to the king's palace where there was prepared a great feast for the seven fairy godmothers. There was placed before each one of them a magnificent case of gold, in which were a spoon, knife and fork, all of pure gold, set with diamonds and rubies. But as everyone was sitting down at the table, they saw a very old fairy, whom they had not invited because she had not left the tower where she had lived for over fifty years, and she was believed to be either dead or under an evil spell. The king could not give her a case of gold as the others had, because they had only made seven for the seven fairies. The old fairy felt insulted and muttered some threats between her teeth. One of the young fairies who sat by her overheard how she grumbled, and guessing that she might give the little princess an unlucky gift, went, as soon as they rose from the table, and hid behind the curtains. In the meanwhile, all the fairies began to give their gifts to the princess. The youngest wished that she should be the most beautiful person in the world, the next that she should have the intelligence of an angel. The third, that she should have a wonderful grace in everything she did. And the fourth, that she should dance perfectly well. And the fifth, that she should sing like a nightingale. And the sixth, that she should play all kinds of music to the utmost perfection. The old fairy's turn came next. And shaking her head with more spite than anger, she wished that one day the princess would have her hand pricked by a needle on a spinning wheel and that she would die of the wound. This terrible gift made the whole company tremble and everybody began to cry. At this very instant, the young fairy came out from behind the curtains and spoke these words aloud. Assure yourselves, O king and queen, that your daughter shall not die of this disaster. It is true, I have no power to undo entirely what the elder fairy has done. The princess shall indeed pierce her hand with a needle on a spinning wheel, but instead of dying, she shall only fall into a deep sleep, which shall last a hundred years, at the end of which a king's son shall come and awake her. The king, to avoid the misfortune foretold by the old fairy, immediately made a law by which everybody was forbidden, on pain of death, to use a spinning wheel, or to have any spinning wheel in their house. About fifteen or sixteen years later, on a day when the king and queen were busy in a far corner of the vast palace, the young and beautiful princess amused herself by running up and down the corridors and going up from one apartment to the other. Eventually, she came into a little room at the top of the tower, where a good old woman, alone, was spinning with her wheel. For this good old woman had never heard of the king's law against spinning wheels. The princess said, "'What are you doing there, good old woman?' I am spinning sheep's wool into the thread so that I can knit it into a cardigan. Ha! said the princess. 
That's very clever. I've never seen that done before. How do you do it? Give it to me so that I may see if I can do the same. Now, whether it was because she was in too much of a hurry, or whether it was because she was clumsy, or whether it was because the old fairy had wished it so, I cannot say. But no sooner than the princess took the spinning wheel than she pricked her hand on the needle and she fell down into a faint. The good old woman, not knowing what to do, cried out for help. People came rushing from all over the palace and they came in great numbers. When they saw the princess lying in a deep, deep sleep on the floor, they threw cold water on her face, they loosened her clothes. They struck her on the palms of her hands, and they rubbed her temples with smelling salts, but nothing they could do would wake the princess. And now the king, who heard the great commotion from the far end of the palace, remembered the terrible warning of the fairies, and guessing what had happened, came rushing to the tower. There he saw the princess lying in a deep, deep sleep. And he ordered her to be carried into the finest apartment in his palace, and to be laid upon a bed all embroidered with gold and silver. If you had seen her, you might have taken her for a little angel. She was so very beautiful, for her swooning away had not paled her complexion. Her cheeks were like roses, her lips were like sea coral. Indeed, Her eyes were shut, but she was heard to breathe softly, which persuaded everyone that she was not dead. The king commanded that they should not disturb her, but let her sleep quietly till her hour of awaking was come. When this accident happened to the princess, the good fairy who had saved her life by condemning her to sleep for a hundred years was in the kingdom of Matakin. Twelve thousand miles away, but she quickly heard the terrible news from a little dwarf who had one hundred mile boots with which he could tread over one hundred miles of ground in a single step. The fairy came immediately, and she arrived at the palace about an hour later in a fiery chariot drawn by dragons. The king took her hand as she stepped out of her chariot, and they both went to look. At the sleeping princess. As the fairy was very good at thinking and planning ahead, she realized that in one hundred years' time, when the princess would wake up, she might not know what to do with herself, being all alone in this old palace. And so this is what she did. She touched with her wand everything in the palace nannies, maids of honor, ladies of the bedchamber. Gentlemen, officers, stewards, cooks, undercooks, cleaners, guards, pages, footmen. She also touched all the horses in the stables and fields, the fierce guard dogs in the outer court, and pretty little Mopsy, too, the prince's little puppy, which lay by her on her bed. Immediately, as soon as she touched them, they all fell asleep, so that They might not awake before their princess, and that they might be ready to serve her when she wanted them. Even the great fires in the ovens of the kitchen, that were just then roasting partridges and pheasants, fell asleep too. All this was done in a moment. Fairies do not take long to finish their business. And now the king and the queen. Having kissed their dear child without waking her, went out of the palace and made an order that nobody should dare to come near it. This, however, was not necessary, for in a quarter of an hour's time, there grew up all round about the palace grounds such a vast number of trees, great and small, bushes and brambles, entwining one another. That neither man nor beast could pass through, so that nothing could be seen but the very tops of the towers of the palace. Nobody doubted but the fairy had demonstrated a very extraordinary sample of her power, and that the princess, while she continued sleeping, 
might have nothing to fear from any curious people. When a hundred years had passed by, the son of a king from another family had gone a hunting in that part of the country where the palace used to be. He asked, What are those towers in the middle of that great thick wood? Everyone answered with the rumours that they had heard. Some said that it was a ruinous old castle haunted by spirits. Others that all the sorcerers and witches of the country used to meet there at midnight when there was a full moon. Most people believed that there was an ogre that lived there and that he used to take to there all the little children he could catch so that he could eat them up whenever he pleased without anybody being able to follow him as only he had the power to pass through the wood. The prince was all in a quandary, not knowing what to believe, when a very good countryman spoke to him as follows. May it please your royal highness, it is now about fifty years since I heard from my father, who heard my grandfather say that there was then in this castle a princess, the most beautiful that was ever seen, and that she must sleep there a hundred years, and she'll be waked by a king's son. The young prince was all on fire at hearing these words, believing, without thinking these things through, that he could save the princess, and pushed on by love and honour, he swore that moment that he would do just that. As he rode on his horse toward the wood, all the great trees, the bushes and brambles gave way to let him pass through. He walked up to the castle, which he saw at the end of a large avenue, and he went into it. And what rather surprised him was that none of his people could follow him, because the trees closed again as soon as he passed through them. However, he did not stop. A young and amorous prince is always brave. He came into a wide, wide outer court, where everything he saw might have frozen the most fearless person with horror. There was a most frightful silence. The image of death everywhere showed itself, and there was nothing to be seen but stretched out bodies of men and animals, all seeming to be dead. But the prince realised when he saw their red faces and pimpled noses of the guards that they were only asleep, and that their glasses in which there still remained some drops of wine, showed plainly that they had fallen asleep whilst drunk. He then crossed a court paved with marble, went up the stairs and came into the corridor where guards were standing, with their rifles upon their shoulders, snoring as loud as they could. After that, he went through several rooms full of gentlemen and ladies, all asleep, some standing, others sitting. At last he came into a chamber all gilded with gold, where he saw upon a bed the most wonderful sight that had ever met his eyes, a princess who appeared to be about fifteen or sixteen years of age and whose bright and rosy beauty was quite angelic. He approached with trembling and admiration and fell down before her upon his knees and kissed her hand. And now, as the evil fairy's spell was at an end, the princess opened her blue eyes for the first time in one hundred years and looking at him said, Is it you, my prince? You have waited a long time. The prince, charmed with these words and much more with the manner in which they were spoken, knew not how to show his joy and gratitude he assured her that he loved her more than anyone or anything in the whole wide world. Their conversation did not make much sense. They spoke with little reason, but a great deal of love. He was more lost for words than she, and we need not wonder at it. For it is very probable, though history mentions nothing of it, that the good fairy, during so long a sleep, 
had given her very agreeable dreams about handsome princes coming to her rescue. In short, they talked four hours together, and yet they said not half what they had to say. In the meanwhile, all the palace awaked, and as all of them were not in love, they felt most desperately hungry after a hundred years without a bit to eat. The chief lady of honour grew very impatient and told the princess aloud that supper was served up. The prince helped the princess to rise. She was entirely dressed and very magnificently. But his royal highness took care not to tell her that she was dressed in the fashion of one hundred years ago, like his great-grandmother. She looked not a bit less charming and beautiful for all that. They went into the great hall of mirrors, where they had supper, and were served by the princess's officers. The orchestra played old tunes, but very nice ones, and after supper, without losing any time, the priest married them in the chapel of the castle, and the chief lady of honour drew the curtains. They had but very little sleep, The princess had had too much of it recently, and the prince left her the next morning to return to the city, where the king was anxiously waiting for him. The second part of The Sleeping Beauty The morning after the handsome prince had married the Sleeping Beauty, he left her and returned home to the city, where his father, the king, was anxiously waiting for him. When he reached home, The prince said that he had lost his way in the forest as he was hunting and that he had slept in the cottage of a farmer who gave him cheese and brown bread. He did not say a word about the sleeping beauty, let alone how he had married her. The king, his father, who was a good man, believed him, but his mother could not be persuaded it was true. And seeing that he went almost every day a-hunting, and that he always had some excuse ready for so doing, though he had slept out three or four nights together, she began to suspect that he was married, for he lived with the princess for over two whole years, and they had two children, the eldest of which, who was a daughter, was named Morning, and the youngest, who was a son, they called Day. The queen spoke several times to her son, to ask him how he passed the time. But he never dared to trust her with his secret. He feared her, though he loved her, for she was of the race of the ogres, and the king would never have married her had it not been for her money. It was even whispered about the court that she had ogrish inclinations, and that whenever she saw little children passing by, she had all the difficulty in the world to stop herself pouncing on them and gobbling them up for a snack. And so, the prince would never tell her one word about his beautiful wife and two little children, but instead kept them a secret. His father died about two years later, and although the prince was very sad, he became lord and master both of the people and of himself. A month later, He announced his marriage to the cheering crowds and he led his beloved wife, the former Sleeping Beauty, in a great procession to the palace. They made a magnificent entry into the capital city, she riding between her two children. For now he was king and she was queen of all the land. Soon after the king went to make war with the emperor Contalabut, his neighbour, He left his wife, the Sleeping Beauty, and his two children, Prince Day and Princess Morning, in the care of his mother. His war went on all summer, and after a while his mother, the Ogress, said to the Sleeping Beauty, Why don't you go to visit your old palace in the forest, my dear, and see that everything is in order there? And I will look after little Princess Morning and little Prince Day. And so the Sleeping Beauty went to visit her old palace in the forest to see that everything was in order there. And she left little Princess Morning and little Prince Day in the care of the king's mother. 
for she did not know that she was an ogress who craved to eat little children for dinner. As soon as the sleeping beauty was gone, the queen went into the palace kitchen. She said, I have an idea to eat little morning for my dinner tomorrow. Ah, madam, cried the chief cook of the kitchen. I will have it so, replied the queen. And this she spoke in the tone of an ogress who had a strong desire to eat fresh meat. And I will eat her with a cranberry sauce. The poor man, knowing very well that he must not play tricks with ogresses, took his great knife and went up into little morning's chamber. She was then four years old and came up to him jumping and laughing to take him about the neck and asked him for some sugar candy, upon which he began to weep. The great knife fell out of his hand and he went back into the yard and killed a little lamb and dressed it with such a good sauce that his mistress assured him that she had never eaten anything so good in her life. But in truth, he had saved little morning and carried her to his wife to hide her in a hut he had at the bottom of the courtyard. About eight days afterward, the wicked queen said to the chief cook of the kitchen, I will eat little day for my supper. He answered not a word, being resolved to cheat her as he had done before. He went out to find little day and saw him with a little sword in his hand with which he was fencing with a great monkey, the child being then only of three years of age. He took him up in his arms and carried him to his wife, that she might hide him in her bedroom along with his sister, and in the place of little day, he cooked up a young goat, very tender, which the ogress found to be wonderfully good. And so far all was well. But one evening, this wicked queen said to her chief cook of the kitchen, I will eat the sleeping beauty, and you will cook her with the same sauce I had with her children. It was now that the poor clerk of the kitchen despaired of being able to deceive her. The young queen was turned of twenty, not reckoning the hundred years she had been asleep, and how to find a beast of the size and shape and firmness, puzzled him. He decided that to save his own life, he must kill the sleeping beauty. And so he went to her palace in the forest, meaning to do just that. He put himself into as foul a mood as he could possibly manage, and came into the sleeping beauty's room in the palace with his dagger in his hand. When he saw her beautiful face, he could not bring himself to kill her, but told her, with a great deal of respect, the orders he had received from the Queen Mother. Do it, do it, said she, stretching out her neck. Execute your orders, and then I shall go and see my children, my poor children, whom I so much and so tenderly loved. For after hearing of the Queen's orders, she thought that they must be dead. No, no, madam, cried the poor chief cook of the kitchen, all in tears. You shall not die, and yet you shall see your children again. But then you must go home with me to my hut, where I have hidden them, and I shall deceive the Queen once more by giving her, in your place, a young deer for her dinner. And so he led her to his hut, where leaving her to embrace her children and to cry along with them, he went and dressed a young deer which the queen had for her supper and devoured it with the same appetite as if it had been the sleeping beauty. She was so delighted with her cruelty and she had invented a story to tell the king on his return how the mad wolves had eaten up his wife and her two children. One evening, when she was rambling round about the courts and yards of the palace to see if she could smell any fresh meat, she heard in a ground room little Prince Day crying, for his mamma was sending him to bed without supper 
because he had been naughty. And she heard at the same time little mourning begging pardon for her brother. The ogress knew the voice of the sleeping beauty and her children, and being quite mad that she had been tricked, she commanded next morning, by break of day, with a most horrible voice which made everybody tremble, that they should bring into the middle of the great court a large tub, which she ordered to be filled with toads, vipers, snakes, and all sorts of serpents, in order to have thrown into it the sleeping beauty and her children, the chief cook of the kitchen, his wife and maid, and all whom she had given orders should be brought there with their hands tied behind them. They were brought out, and the executioners were just going to throw them into the tub when the king, who was not so soon expected, entered the court on horseback, for he came post, and asked with the utmost astonishment what was the meaning of this horrible spectacle. No one dared tell him, but the ogress, all in a fury to see what had happened, threw herself head first into the tub and was instantly gobbled up by the ugly creatures she had ordered to be thrown into it for the others. The king was very sorry, for the ogress had been his own mother, but he soon comforted himself with his beautiful wife and his pretty children, and they lived happily ever after. The end. I hope you enjoy it. Don't forget to like, subscribe my channel and press the bell icon to get more update videos. Bye bye!